Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I'm a mentalist, uh, an environmentalist, and today I am going to talk to you uh, about how you can change the way you eat uh, and become healthier, leaner, sexier, more virile, uh, kinder, longer living, and save the world at the same time. By putting less lives on your plate, you can put more years on your life. Uh, and by living more kindly on the land and by conserving the seas, we can actually protect and create more space for nature on the planet. We can eliminate world hunger. We can tackle climate change, even as we grow to nine billion people by mid-century. How does that sound? <laughs> so, like most of us, I fell in love with nature as a child. This is in Norfolk, uh, in North Norfolk in Blakeney, where I used to spend half my time um, covered in mud. Uh, and that time spent by the sea was very formative, uh, and I became a marine biologist. Uh, I was a fisheries biologist. I worked all over the world. I worked on prawn fisheries in Australia. Uh, I worked on reef fisheries in New Caledonia. Uh, I got blown away uh, living in the Orkney Islands. Um, and I soon realized that as a marine biologist and as a fisheries biologist, I was going to spend my whole career saying, if you don't stop catching all the fish, there won't be any fish. Um, so I decided I had to get into kind of broader communications and campaigning uh, around sustainability. And so for the last 15 years, it's been my mission uh, to try and make sustainable development so desirable it becomes normal. And that's through this idea of imagining better. So not accepting the status quo. If you want to create the world, first you've got to imagine a better one. We've got to put ourselves in the position of future optimism, of being future literate of what the opportunities for change uh, and transformation really are. Um, and one of the biggest things I did, actually, through all the work I was doing on climate change, uh, around about 10, 11 years ago, I gave up flying on holiday. Um, it felt very hypocritical to be doing this carbon-intensive behavior, the most carbon-intensive thing you can do when you've been working on climate change for as long as I had. Uh, and seven years ago, I went around the world without flying, just to demonstrate uh, in a really kind of masochistic way uh, that this could actually be a joy. Uh, and one of the amazing things that that trip taught me was it was about rediscovering the sense of romance and adventure when you travel through the world rather than just over it. And it was that gradual transition of landscape, culture, people, language, and of course cuisine, and food we're talking about here today, that made me realize that what we have in common and what we share is far, far more important and more significant than the relatively petty things that divide us. So it was really about understanding that our hopes and aspirations are the same wherever we are in the world. Um, and today we're here to imagine better about the food system and the food we eat. Um, and obviously this is something that we all have in common. We all have to eat uh, every day. And I think there's something really powerful uh, about this notion of the future of food. Personally, I really hope this is not the future of food. Uh, the idea of sort of popping a nutrient pill um, to get my sustenance fills me uh, with sort of dread and horror. I love food, I love cooking, I love the idea of sharing it. I think food should be joyous and celebratory. Um, obviously, popping pills can be joyous and celebratory, but um, <laughs> let's not comment on that here. Um, but food is incredibly important culturally. I'm sure Claudia is going to talk about this later. It's one of the reasons why we're all here. And it informs so much of the way we see the world uh, and the things that we va value culturally. Even as someone who runs a business, the word company comes from the Latin companio. It means literally who you break bread with, who you eat bread with. And I think we've already touched on with uh, Mark's inspirational talk how businesses with a sense of purpose around the future of food, a sense of purpose which is bigger than themselves, which is not just about the money, but it is about a mission, about a kind of obligation and an opportunity to change the world are the things that are really inspiring. Because food itself is not just calories either. Food has huge purpose and influence and has the ability to transform the world around us. Um, and food is also social. Um, you know, we all love eating with our friends. We gather together. We dine together. Um, we eat with our families. You know, these are things which form strong social bonds. And this is even shared by some of our closest relatives. Uh, these are very cute bonobo chimpanzees. Um, and they use food to broker friendships. When they meet a stranger bonobo, they will share their food with them in order to get them on side. Um, if you know much about the behavior of bonobos, they then often do other things. Um, but you know, the whole idea of this is it's, it's vitally important socially for building these bonds uh, between each other. But food, I think, is a little bit pornographic right now. You know, it's become very self-centered. 
You know, we have started to think about this as sort of titillation and entertainment. We've become obsessed with novelty. Um, and I think this is the kind of pinnacle of our consumer mindset. When we talk about food, we talk about consuming and being consum consumers. Uh, and I think this is a problem because when we label and frame people as consumers, we make them selfish. We make them self-interested. We make them obsessed with their own individual rights. It becomes all about them. And so I think food has taken us into a strange place right now. We have become narcissistic. You know, food says volumes and speaks volumes about who we are. There are a million different ways now we can order a coffee, you know, with various different incarnations, where we whip the milk, the temperature it's served at, the combinations, the kind of flavoured syrups, the whipped cream on top, do you want it on ice? All of these kind of things. And equally, we've become faddish in our diets. It's no fat, low fat, gluten free, macrobiotic, paleo, you know, we all becoming a little bit narcissistic because I think the issue here is it's very clear about what the food that I eat says about me, but what does the food that we are eating collectively say about us? You know, when a billion people on the planet go to bed hungry every night, are we overindulging? Are we framing this in the wrong way? Is it time to be a little bit more humble, a bit more outward looking? Uh, a bit more of seeing of the bigger picture and the context that's out there. Because the way we eat is at the heart of our sustainability challenge. You know, we literally are what we eat, and the way we eat shapes and influences the world around us. And we don't have a food problem. We have a food production and distribution problem. We are producing the wrong food in the wrong places. We already produce enough food to feed nine billion people. We live in a time of abundance, but that food is not getting to the right people and it's not the right type of food. So with only seven and a half billion people on the planet, we already have a glut and yet a billion people are still starving. Now, why is that? Well, Mark touched on this in a way. You know, actually it's because 30 to 50% of that food never gets anywhere near a human stomach. Now that is an insane amount of waste. You know, it's to do with uh, problems in our supply chain, the way we farm, the way we transport, the way we store. Uh, and as we've already touched upon, it's often worse in the hungriest parts of the planet. In sub-Saharan Africa, you know, where a quarter of the population are hungry, over a third of that food gets wasted. Um, and in Europe, it's the reverse. You know, uh, we've sorted out the kind of the farming and the processing and the transportation and the storage. But then we throw away a third of the food because it doesn't look right. Uh, it doesn't match the appearances we expect of it. Um, and then the food we take into our homes, we waste another 30 to 50% of that, which is equivalent of 100 million tons of food every year. So we have this system which is kind of ass about face. You know, we are, we are not saving the food in the right way. And this is enormously important because of the inputs that go into that food. You know, the two billion tons of food that we're wasting each year has a vast amount of resources embedded in it in terms of energy, in terms of water, in terms of chemicals, in terms of human labor and toil. And it also has massive impacts. You know, it means deforestation, it means land degradation, it means agricultural runoff and eutrophication of rivers and the seas. Those are huge impacts. We are trashing paradise to produce food that we don't eat. Now that, as I say, is madness. So just to put this in context, you know, every cup of tea that you get left undrunk, so someone makes you a cup of tea at work, it sits on your desk, you forget about it, 27 liters embodied in the tea that was required to make that cup of tea. Uh, the most ridiculous one, I think, in terms of scale and impact is the, uh, the joy of a Californian almond, uh, which takes four liters of water to grow one almond uh, in what is essentially a desert uh, in California. Uh, but the, really the big one, and you know where this is going, uh, is the burger, you know, the beef burger. So we have 460 gallons of water, 6 kilos of cattle feed, 65 square feet of land, and 2 kilos of carbon dioxide embedded in that one humble burger. That's a lot of embodied resource. And this is why, you know, as an environmentalist been working in this for 20 years, uh, I see the plastic bag debate as a little bit of a distraction. So everyone gets their knickers in a twist about the plastic bags. Um, let's focus on the real issue here. The impact of the shopping you put in your bag is hundreds, if not thousands, of times bigger than the impact of the bag itself. 
You know, that's the real issue. It's not what we're carrying our shopping home in, it's what we're buying and what we're doing with it that's the real problem. Um, it doesn't help that our brain chemistry is a little bit uh, evolutionary compromised. Um, we evolved in a, in a context in which it was hard to get hold of fat, sugar, and salt. So when we eat these things, uh, there are special receptors in the brain which fire off our pleasure centers. We get a lot of dopamine released. It's exactly the same effect with sugar as it is with cocaine and heroin. It's no wonder we're addicted to the wrong sorts of food. But the issue here is not just what this is doing to us as individuals, it's what our choices in our diet uh, are doing to the world around us. And there's a, there's a cow in the room we don't like to talk about. Um, everyone talks about the elephant in the room. I'm going to talk about the cow and the pig and the chicken. Because I had a revelation the other week where I discovered that actually 18% of global carbon emissions come from livestock agriculture. That's bigger than the 15% that comes from all our transport combined. That's every plane, every bus, every train, every car, moped, tuk-tuk, wherever you are in the world. The carbon emissions which are coming from livestock are bigger than that. And we can change that tomorrow. We can change the way we eat and we can change the way our agriculture works. So for someone who gave up flying over a decade ago, that was quite a wake-up call for me. And there are now 70 billion animals in our global livestock agricultural industry. That's nearly 10 for every single one of us on the planet. Every hour, 6 million animals are slaughtered. That's every hour. This is death on a grand scale. And it's bad for us and it's bad for the planet. It's bad for us because too much meat and dairy in our diet increases our risk of cancer, it leads to obesity, it's associated with heart disease. Uh, the, it's bad for the planet because it's leading to deforestation, soil degradation, you know, uh, a kind of a rapacious land use. So we have to try and find some way out of this. Um, and this is where I think it gets really interesting. But we're allowing this to happen because of our, our separation. We live in the desert of the real. You know, we all, over half of us globally now live in cities. So we are disconnected fundamentally from the landscapes which provide our food. We live in this world of plenty uh, where very few of us have, have seen a farm, perhaps in recent months, maybe not in years. Kids which are raised in the city have never seen a farm. You know, we are living in this desert of the real where we, are, we think there is provenance and plenty, uh, but there is all sorts of dark things going on in our name. And this leads to what I call the illusion of separation. You know, Descartes first coined this, but the illusion of separation is a cognitive and optical delusion. We are all connected. We are all interdependent fundamentally. And when we have this separation, it allows us to treat other people and animals and the planet in a utilitarian way, in an exploitative way, as resources. Animals and the planet are not resources. They are family. You know, we are part of them. And we are indulging, if you like, in a willful blindness. We don't want to actively think about what is going on. We're in denial. You know, we are essentially apologists for the giant meat and agricultural industries which are arguing that they are meeting our evolving needs. Uh, and they are doing that in our name. Um, and it's up to us to challenge them. And it's a bit like the scene in The Matrix, you know, where Morpheus says to Neo, do you want to take the red pill or the blue? You know, where the blue represents continuing to live in the blissful ignorance of illusion, and red represents the painful truth of a new reality. Um, there is a painful truth of a new reality we have to wake up to in the context of food. Um, and in that also lies opportunity. Um, there are amazing food tech innovations. We've heard about some of them this morning. We'll hear about more of them this afternoon. This is just one that I'm involved in. Um, Rich is at the back there, I believe. These two gentlemen, Steve and Rich, um, over a pub conversation about how we we're going to feed people in the future, decided to set up a renewable energy-powered, LED-lit hydroponic farm in a tube tunnel 30 metres under South London. <laughs> Perfectly sensible. Um, but they've done it. They've crowdfunded over a million pounds in order to do it. They're up and growing. They're going to be selling their produce in New Covent Garden Market next week. These are the visionaries of the future. Your food tech business and your food innovation must and ought to serve a higher purpose. As my friend Mark Stevenson says, what side of history do you want to be on? Because we are the ones who are making the positive change. We are the ones who are going to change the world. And there is a win-win emerging here. There is a perfect moment of serendipity because in tackling our interconnected challenges, hunger and obesity, climate change, biodiversity loss, 
It turns out that the diet that is better for us is also better for the planet. You know, we can liberate some of those 70 billion livestock from their miserable existences and put them back in the fields. We can get 15 times more protein per unit of arable land than we can if we use that land to grow feed for livestock. We can reduce the overfishing and allow our oceans to recover. We can tackle climate change and bring our carbon emissions down. And we can eliminate food waste to feed everyone on the planet and no one need ever go hungry again. We are all environmental activists. Three times a day, every mouthful you take shapes the world. You know, what we eat and where it comes from matters. It's a real and influential choice. We either eat for our future or we simply eat our future. Please use the power of your appetites wisely. Thank you very much. <laughs>